On April 23, 1927, the very last day of the season's work in the Eastern Cemetery, the Harvard University Boston Museum of Fine Arts Expedition, under George Reisner, was cleaning the east face of a tomb. Suddenly, a doorway appeared in an unusual place, below ground level. Two unique inscriptions flanked the entranceway, giving the name of the tomb owner as Queen Marisank. The date of Marisank's death is recorded on the right, as year one, first month of the third season, day 21, of an unnamed king. On the left, her burial is listed, taking place on year two, second month of the second season, day 18. This is an unusually long interval of 272 days, a little over nine months. But who was the king? Climbing in through the door on top of a hill of debris, the excavators gazed upon one of the most colorful sights they had ever seen, a beautifully carved and painted subterranean chapel, consisting of three separate rooms, 20 engaged statues, and a burial shaft. Usually, such chapels were located above ground in the core of the tomb's superstructure. Marisank's chapel is one of the most important of all at Giza. Along with its spectacular color, it shows a wide variety of scenes of funerary ritual and daily life, and key information for reconstructing the genealogy and history of the royal family of the fourth dynasty. On the east wall of the main room, we see scenes of busy activity, including, from top to bottom, offering bearers from estates, bird trapping in the marshes with a clap net, and processions of livestock. Further to the left, or north, stands Marisank with short hair, beside or behind her mother, Queen Hedeparis II, both in a small papyrus skiff. The two women are pulling up papyrus plants in a ritual associated with the goddess Hathor. Behind them stands the portly figure of Marisank's father, Kawab, eldest son of King Khufu, who for some reason never reached the throne to become pharaoh. Passing the two pillars, showing beautiful standing images of Marisank, we enter the north room, which contains ten engaged female statues. The only inscription here, above them, mentions Marisank. An interesting scene appears on the west wall, where Marisank's mother, Hedeparis II, wears a robe with high, pointed shoulders. Note the yellow or blonde hair or wig coloring outlined with red guidelines. Marisank follows in elaborate dress, while her son, the well-known Nebemaket, brings up the rear. The south wall has more offering bearers and produce, but also some interesting scenes of furniture, a carrying chair, sitting chair, bed canopy, and headrest. Niche statues of six unnamed men, all seated cross-legged in the pose of scribes, adorn the lower part of this wall. The group of four scribes was not carved, but cemented in place. In an unusual touch, two of the artists are actually named in hieroglyphs on the south and east walls. In the western room, the decoration was never finished. Two pair statues oversee the mouth of the burial shaft, which leads down to the burial chamber, extending to the west, not to the south, as was more typical. Here lay the queen's sarcophagus, accompanied by four limestone canopic jars for her internal organs and a few other small objects. The burial chamber had been plundered, and thieves had propped open the sarcophagus lid with loose stones. But the queen's skeletal remains were found inside. They appeared to indicate a woman of about five feet tall and 50 years old. An important vertical inscription on the sarcophagus reads, I, meaning Hedeparis II, have given it, meaning the sarcophagus, to the king's daughter and king's wife, Marisank. Some scholars, such as Reisner, have argued that this text proves that Marisank died before her mother, Hedeparis II, and thus the tomb was repurposed from mother Hedeparis to daughter Marisank. But the evidence is not so straightforward. <laughs>